Hello and welcome to this clip on the ideal gas equation. It's actually an update of my old clip where there was an 8 minute gap where there was no speaking, which I wasn't able to go back and fix for some reason. So I've decided to redo it and make the whole thing a little bit shorter. Uh, in addition, um, I've added an extra section um, on how to spot errors in experimental techniques using PV equals NRT that will enable you to see what part of the PV equals NRT equation a certain mistake in a procedural error might affect the most and what effect it might have on the final answer. So the stuff we'll go through is the basis of ideal gas behaviour, some of the assumptions that we make um, when assuming ideal gas behaviour, and uh, the components of the equation, how to rearrange it, including the units, and how to spot uh, when to use the equation in a typical worked exam question. And the clip is assuming that you are already competent and comfortable in the use of moles equals mass over MR or moles equals mass over molar mass. So there are a few assumptions that we make about how most gas particles behave in a gas sample most of the time. Obviously we can't look at every single gas power particle that are present in a given sample, so uh, we have to make an assumption that there are certain things that most of them do, so we can apply these things mathematically, these ideas mathematically, and then calculate and try and work out what the gas is likely to do under certain conditions. By and large, we found that our use of PV with an RT has allowed us to engineer uh, machines and devices that uh, rely on gas pressure changes, such as internal combustion engines, very effectively. So there's plenty of evidence to suggest that we're in the right ballpark, even though we have to concede and accept that some of the gas particles within our, part, our sample might not be behaving in an ideal manner. For instance, we assume that particles are spherical, they travel in straight lines and are not subject to intermolecular forces. So you can see in the two pictures that there's actually an acceptance that gas particles actually behave in a different way to the ideal um, gas behaviour model, but our calculations are based on the ideal gas behaviour model to keep things simple and workable. We also assume that particles have greater kinetic energy at higher temperatures or pressures, Collisions are elastic, meaning no energy loss on collision. The size of the particles is negligible and their motion is random. So real gas behaviour might look a little bit more like the animation in the bottom right. It might not be perfect, but you can see that there's changes in the speed of the particles. Uh, they do have random motion, uh, but there isn't necessarily um, elastic collisions. There's definite loss of energy when some particles collide with each other in certain orientations. This makes it quite difficult to calculate precisely what the gas is going to do, so we tend to assume that uh, this isn't what happens because it's not ideal behaviour. So the ideal gas equation is called PV equals NRT. Pressure is normally written as a small p for our specification. The pressure is normally given in pascals. The temperature is in kelvins. The volume is in meters cubed. And the standard gas constant that we use for our specification is 8.314 joules per mole to the minus 1 per kelvin to the minus 1. What that means is it takes 8.314 joules of energy to raise one mole of gas by one kelvin of temperature. It's vital that these units are actually used because this is what the ideal gas equation requires us to do. So let's look at some unit conversions. To convert centimetres cubed to metres cubed, we multiply times 10 to the minus 6. To convert decimetres cubed to metres cubed, we multiply times 10 to the minus 3, or divide by 1,000. To convert degrees Celsius, or centigrade, to kelvins, you add 273. And to convert kilopascals to pascals, you multiply by 1,000, or times 10 to the power of 3. So let's now look at rearranging the formula. So there are your four rearrangements, and there's a little tip to bear in mind when you're rearranging an equation that has five components instead of three. So a five component equation doesn't go into a triangle quite as easily. You can make the five component 
uh, expression into a three component expression. So you can see that each of those um, expressions and rearrangements, they have a subject, they'll have a numerator, and they'll also have a, a denominator which I've now color-coded. So the trick is to always keep one side of the equation, as in the PV side, on the top, and the other side on the bottom. So you can have PV on the bottom or the top, it doesn't really matter, but if you look closely you'll see that what I haven't done is taken a part of the left-hand side and a part of the right-hand side and popped them on top and the bottom opposite each other. So all of the rearrangements, if you look closely, they have the same components, such as number of moles, gas and temperature, for example, on one side, on one half, denominator or numerator, and the pressure and volume components on the bottom, obviously depending on what the subject actually is. So unless you've done a flashcard already to have these rearrangements, it might be worth jotting them down and putting them on a flashcard now before we go any further. So let's have a look at a typical examination question of reasonable level of challenge. So it says nitromethane is used for as an energy-rich fuel for motor racing. It burns in oxygen, forming three gases, which we've now colour-coded. Then it says a one mole sample of nitromethane was burned in oxygen forming the product shown in the equation. It asks you to calculate the total volume of gases at room temperature and pressure, 298K and 100 kilopascals, assuming that the water is gaseous. Now obviously it's a combustion, so generally the water will be heated when it's produced to a certain degree that, so that it can be formed as a gas. So that's why it's got a gas next to it rather than a liquid. We've got to be a little bit careful here because the molar ratios are such that the nitromethane comes as two moles matching that molar ratio. So two moles of carbon dioxide, three moles of water and one mole of nitrogen comes from two moles of nitromethane, which I've now highlighted. So it asks you to calculate the total volume of gases, which I've highlighted in the question. So therefore, what that means is that all of the products of gases, they want you to tell them what the total volume of all gases produced actually is. So you can see that it's six moles of gases, but the thing is that's actually produced from two moles of nitromethane. But the problem is we're only provided with one mole. So because we've had to divide the two in half to make one mole, to match our question, there, that must mean we have to divide the six moles in half to make three moles of gas in total. So now what we can do is we can start putting our figures into PV equals NRT. So because it's, it's asking us to calculate the total volume of gases, we need to make sure that V is the subject, so I've had to rearrange PV equals NRT so that it has V as the subject. So it gives us 3 moles times 8.314 times 298 over 100,000 and that gives us 7.43 times 10 to the minus 2 meters cubed. You can see the workings at the bottom of the screen but I just want to, wanted to talk through them so you could understand where we're coming from. So I've labelled up the V equals NRT over P rearrangement and I've also asked you to make a note of the unit conversions each time. OK, then it says the combination reaction is very exothermic. It reaches a temperature of 1,000 Kelvin. Determine the total volume of gases when the temperature is raised to 1,000 Kelvin at a constant pressure. So this time we want the same answer, but what it would be at a higher temperature. So we've got to scale 298 up to 1,000. So if you look at the workings at the bottom that the, uh, the question has, I've done it in a slightly different way to that printed version. So what I've done is I've taken my total volume of gases, which I had in part A, which is 7.43 times 10 to the minus 2, 
which is what the total volume of gases would be at 298 K. Now I want to know what they would be at 1000 K, a higher temperature. So the reason I multiply it by 1000 over 298 is because 1000 over 298 gives me the scaling factor. In other words, how many times 298 has to be multiplied to get it to 1000. If we plug those numbers into our calculator, it indeed gives us the same answer as the one printed at the bottom, which is 0 0.249 metres cubed. OK, so let's now go on and have a look at how we might use PV equals NRT in the lab, looking at a practical we've used in our um, sessions at college, and look at how some of the errors that might be made might affect our final result. So this represents what we used here at college, and basically we used ethanol, <clears throat> so our volatile unknown is ethanol. And obviously it's added as a liquid, and as you can see clearly, it's put into boiling water, or a boiling water bath, and that allows the liquid to evaporate. So we get C2H5OH as a gas. So we weigh the apparatus before and after addition of the ethanol to obtain the mass of the ethanol by difference. At the start, when we've added the ethanol and we put the, the aluminium foil across the top of the, uh, the conical flask, uh, we introduce a small pinhole. We have the aluminium foil held in place by uh, some, uh, a piece of rubber band, and the pinhole allows the excess ethanol vapour to vent. So we're only interested in the vapour within the flask. So once this pinhole has been introduced, we can then clamp our assembly, like it shows in the main diagram, and heat it until the water gently starts to boil. So what we're trying to do is make the ethanol evaporate. So the little squiggly arrows on the main diagram are a rather lame attempt to show the ethanol vapour um, coming off the little pool of ethanol that you can see clearly labelled as a volatile unknown. So essentially the ethanol vapour then fills the internal volume of your conical flask. So we can start collecting pieces of data now that will allow us to use PV equals NRT. So if we know that the pressure at, at um, sea level of atmospheric pressure is 100,000 pascals, the volume can be the measured internal volume of the flask in metres cubed. This can be obtained by filling the flask after the experiment with water right up to the brim and pouring this amount of water into another measuring cylinder and checking what volume it, uh, it adds up to. Careful not to spill any. The thermometer reading that you get at the end of the experiment is, the, uh, is converted to Kelvin by adding 273 like we covered earlier. So we need to work out the number of moles of ethanol vapour that we have. Why do we need the number of moles of ethanol vapour? So once we've worked out the number of moles, we can then work out the mass of the ethanol, which if I can refer you to the top right hand corner of the screen, is obtained by weighing the apparatus before and after the addition of the ethanol. So that gives us the mass. We can use PV equals NRT, or N equals PV over RT, to work out the moles. And we can check the MR. It should get quite close to 46.0 grams per mole to the minus 1. And what makes quite a useful discussion is if you do this in reality and actually don't get 46.0 grams per mole to the minus 1, you can work your way back through the calculation and try and work out if any experimental errors actually might have affected that. So, for example, if, let's say, the volume of water that you measured as being inside the, um, the conical flask, when I transferred it, when I demonstrated it in front of my group, I spilt a little bit. So that would have meant that V, in the bottom right-hand corner, goes down. So if the volume of the container that I'm measuring, I measure it as a little bit less because I spilt some of the water, then that means a smaller numerator is being divided by the same size denominator. So RT stays the same, PV goes down. That means the number of moles also goes down. That then means the number of moles as the denominator of MR equals mass over moles also goes down. 
that now means that the same mass is being divided by a smaller number, so your MR goes up. And what I found when I actually did that for in reality in front of one of my classes is we got around 91 grams per mole. A massive increase. So obviously that's incorrect. It's more than double the actual MR. But what we were able to do was to work out the error. So in doing so, we were able to make a positive out of a negative. This is something that they'll expect you to be able to do in a paper. They'll introduce uh, a theoretical practical, and they'll then explain to you that a mistake was made in that practical, and you'll have to work through the calculation that you get from the practical to see if you can deduce whereabouts that mistake might have had an effect. In other words, will it make your final value bigger or smaller than what you, do, what you were hoping to get? Okay, so hopefully this has been a fairly useful clip to take you through the basics of PB equals NRT and some of the ways we can look at the errors in classroom practicals uh, using a PB equals NRT type practical as an uh, example. Obviously, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to email your teacher or maybe come and speak to them in college or pop into a subject extension to have a chat to one of us. So in the meantime, thanks for your time, thanks for listening, and see you soon.